yeah. start. Yeah. <laughs> right, grand. So um, thank you very much, uh, Siobhan Doherty, for coming and having a chat with me today. I really appreciate you taking um, the time to talk to me. Um, so I first came across your lovely work on the postage stamps uh, yes. series that you did a couple of years ago. Yes. And um, I've been following your work on Instagram and that ever since. Um, so how did your journey into botanical art start? And then maybe you could tell me a little bit about the whole. And then how did I, um, well, I was actually living in, I've always loved drawing the things from nature, but when I was at school and I mentioned that I wanted to do things from nature, it was like, oh no, because you'd be working from photographs and, you know, they, they didn't, I, I wasn't encouraged to do it. And then, but I've always painted, I didn't go to art college. But everybody was always saying to me, you have to loosen up. You have to, you know, be a bit more expressive. It was just a different type of uh, genre of art. Everybody wanted me to be more arty. And I was living in Egypt and I went to London on holiday and saw the Shirley Sherwood Gallery in Kew Gardens and walked in there and went, oh, my God, I want to be a botanical artist. Because I just was amazed at the amount of detail and the precision and I was with my aunt at the time who turned around to me and said, oh, you have to be really good to be a botanical artist. And um, I'm kind of like, give me a challenge and I'll do it. So I went back to live in, I was living in Egypt for about 10 years. And um, I applied for, there was a distance learning diploma course on botanical art. And at the time my kids were very small and I realized that I was, you know, my children would discover things that I, wouldn't notice you know you you're going to find it yourself with your own child you know they're picking up insects and well what's this you know and what's mm -hmm. this plant and you know and I was drawing those and then researching it so it was kind of like a natural progression into botanical art um unfortunately there isn't the same kind of training for somebody who wants to do insects it's botanical art is you will get trained there's a lot of information online and teach you so anyway I did the diploma course um and learned a huge amount I think botanical art just kind of takes watercolor to that next level because it's very, very meticulous and everything has to be scientifically accurate. You have to understand how things to go together and how to draw from life and how to really observe all the details. And I think you have to be a little bit OCD, which is probably suits my personality. Like I love finding out different things about um, what I'm painting. And anyway, I finished the course was doing botanical art and decided to go into the Natural History Museum and um, basically stalked Nigel, <laughs> Nigel Monaghan, who's the, the, the keeper of the dead zoo, and kind of said to him, you know, I'd like to come into you, you know, and, and very nicely he said, yeah, sure, come in. And he showed me around the whole collection and then said, well, but why are you here? And I said, well, because I... You know, my kids are complaining because I have too many dead insects in my freezer. <laughs> <It's> like, um, <clears throat> so he told me about a pollinator plan that was being start started and it was new scientists and he advised me to go down there. So I drove down to book the ticket, went down. I had a clue about bees. I mean, I knew I liked insects and I liked the nat natural, natural world. Um, I love plants. But, you know, I didn't know anything about bees, but um, I went there and it was just so inspiring. You know, you had all these people, pe groups from every walk of life and these scientists who were explaining what was happening with our bees and, you know, the life cycle of bees and how, you know, if we save the bees, we're actually going to save all of nature. And I came out of there going, oh, I want to be a bee warrior. I really want to be a bee warrior. I want to save bees. So um, I actually went up, they had people, you know, from Irish Rail, from um, Irish Waterways, Board Bia, farmers, horticulturists, um, a lot of beekeepers there as well. And um, they'd no artist. So I went up and basically introduced myself and said, look, I'm a botanical artist. I would, you know, really like to get involved in some way. And they contacted me a week later and said that they um, would I be interested in doing the logo and I went yeah yeah of course I'd love to Which do it. You can see all over Ireland <clears throat> now. Yeah exactly and they said but we we have no money 
And I went, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Even though I was broke. Um, and I'm just like, yeah, you know, no, no, I'll do it. And I tend to do things like throw myself into it. So I started like really researching bees and I produced the Irish pollinator plan um, logo. I actually have a photograph of that if you want me to share the screen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it is, if I can find it here. Um, so I did the research for that. I started off doing a little page. This is something, can you see that there? This yeah. little page of bee study. So this was, obviously I was looking at bumblebees at the time. They wanted a uh, Bombus fortorum on um, knapweed. So what I tend to do is like work out the colors, look at all the different mm. shapes and try to understand what I was doing, what wasn't going to work. Obviously, if you look at bees, sometimes you'll find them like this with their legs all over the place and it's a bit too spidery. They wanted something tucked in and cute. So um, I then did, I'm going to just find the next photograph, which is the pollinator plan. Um, I did the logo for them um, and that's pretty much, I don't know if I can actually shape, I did that painting for them. They wanted the, this, bumble, this particular bumblebee on that. And I love painting it. I really enjoyed it. And obviously then they adopted that for their, um, they adopted that for their for their logo and do you know what it was it, it's so satisfying to see this sign kind of popping up all over the place um i mean what how lucky i am i mean i get really excited every time i see it and go oh my god that's my bee you know it's it's, it's everywhere it's it like every everywhere state has a corner now exactly you know, where you see it yeah and and nicely it's always in a in a row of like beautiful wildflowers where yeah. there were you know there were there was just ordinary grass or kind of like really scruffy unkept um kind of air although yeah. scruffy unkept is good but suddenly you've got like poppies and wildflowers and people kind of saying yeah daisies are good dandelions are good so sometimes um, there were in places that were just grass as well like as in manicured grass and now you see yeah. these lovely wildflower patches popping exactly up on it. yeah i think i think una fitzpatrick said it you know we just we need to move away from the lawn and lollipop approach to parks mm. and and places like that um but anyway just opening that kind of research kind of really made me realize that like what are we doing to our children even things like you know um you know, like um, nettles and and other plants in societies. You know, we're teaching our kids that these are bad and that they're they're harmful for us. And you know, I, I used to get really. I lived in Dublin at the time, and I used to get really cross when I see them going around with pesticides, mm -hmm. and it kind of go up. You know, like, but don't you know that there's no such thing as a specific pesticide that only harms whatever you're trying to get rid of, the weeds or herbicides. You know, you're getting rid of all the, the creatures. You know, if you've got nettles, you've got butterflies. You know, we love butterflies. Let's keep the nettles. So um, anyway, I was very lucky because at the time there was a beekeeper on the stamp design committee for Unpost and they decided that they would also like to do something for bees in Ireland. And they asked me then, they contacted me and asked me, would I be interested in doing a set of stamps on native bees? Um, uh, I love working for on post um, because they just they t I have friends of mine who do the stamps for the Royal Mail in the UK and it's a completely different approach a very prescriptive and they're they're whatever whereas on post says you know, we want native bees can you often do the you know the research yourself <laughs> going yeah great and the thing I love about it is that it gave me the opportunity to talk to all different people you know who are experts um, I got back to the pollinator committee and they uh, and asked them which bees did they think I should feature, and they did say there was a little bit you know the beekeepers going but what about the honeybee you know the honeybee is really important, um, whereas the you know the pollinator plan people were saying well look let's feature the solitary bees because whatever at the end of the day it's about raising awareness and if you you if you help one bee you're helping all of the bees. Yeah. Um, so I, um, you know, I did the bee stamps. I find a photograph of those now for you, um, and I included a. I find the right folder. I don't know if I can share these across. Um, I did the bee stamps, and I included a honeybee on the um, first day cover, which is this. Yeah. Which unfortunately, I did this really big. I was like a huge painting, but they had actually, when they put it onto the first day cover, they did it like a, a honeybee size, which was a bit kind of disappointing. Uh, so you're but, um, 
I know, I know. I mean, there was so much little detail in there. Every single little bee, every little single hair was um, was uh, um, painted like perfectly. And um, yeah, I, I just loved painting it. But um, I'll try and see. Does this share if I go across this way? Um, no. It's no. Just okay. The same. Let's yeah. Stop. Stop and share. Okay. Hold on. I'll share the next one. So the stamps they decided to do were these ones. Can you see that now? The stamps. Yeah. That's yeah. Okay. So, so these were the the ones that came up. It was on Pa's idea to do them as a honeycomb shape, which was. I thought it was genius and because they felt that bees were really important in our culture and in our I mean we've got a huge a really long history of bees in Ireland you know even laws and the Breton laws they were I think it was nine pages devoted only to honeybees and keeping bees which which I think is really you know forward thinking of our our, our ancestors um, but they they use the the type there is actually done in gold ink as well. So they wanted to make it something really important. And what was really lovely was that it really hit the mark with the people. People really enjoyed it. Um, I've had so many people contact me as a result of it. And um, I'll show you. My favorite is the mini sheet, which was this one. Um, I wanted to do like a um, a bee's eye view of a meadow. Um, and all the bees kind of like flying in to that. Yeah. Um, but what was really nice about that is that on post then contacted me and um, they, when we launched the stamps, they put bees, honeybees on top of the roof of the GPO on O'Connell Street. And I um, actually have a little jar. No, actually, I did the a little design for them of it. Oh, no. And there's the unpossed honey, um, the GPO honey. It's called the, oops, this way here. It's called the Rising Bee. They have done quite a bit of work for other bee, been contacted by other bee companies um, to do logos and to, you know, design bees for labels. Um, Sometimes I just like send over images that I have and say, yeah, just use this. You know, they're friends yeah, of mine yeah. who've actually asked them to do it. Um, I did a recent one. What, what's really nice is that I, when I work, when I work with bees, I prefer instead of working from a photograph, I actually prefer to work from the actual subject um, itself. And if I can incorporate um, a bee that is actually from the hive that I'm doing the work for. So um, I found this, I think you might enjoy this. So I was actually going to ask you that, um, uh, yeah. about, do you use photos or specimens, you know, to get that? Because I noticed you're, you're, a mixture, you're very into details. A, a mixture of both. Um, mm. Here you go, top secret. Okay, so I had to do a painting of a, um, let's do it like this. I had to do a painting of a bee. Can you see that one there? Is that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, this was actually a bee that came from a particular hive and I don't think they've actually launched it yet, so I shouldn't mention it, but they're lovely people, they keep hives, um, they have a, a, a bee company um, or beeswax company and they, I took one of their little bees and it actually died, this one, I took a selection, of them. some of them die a bit, you know, <laughs> legs and arms akimbo and I what I do is when I get the live specimens, I put them into the freezer yeah. and then um, so that it kills off any mites and I have a whole collection of them there. So this is one of their little bees and there's actually a pin through the flower. Yeah. Um, so if you look at the next photograph, you'll see that um, it just made my life easier. That was the flower itself um, with the pin. So basically I had the, um, you know, the pin through the flower, the flower on the bee, and it just gave me the right image of, um, you know, where the bee, how the bee would look on that flower, where the shadow would be, the size of the bee to the flower, um, how they would sit. But obviously when you're painting bees, I'll just show you here now. The, the funny thing about it is that it kind of, for uh, for about as I was painting it, I started getting here's the finished painting. There you go. So you can see the the little dead bee. But yeah. then I have to incorporate. Obviously, when a bee has died, I um its antennae kind of flop down and its eyes kind of glaze over. The legs don't look as if they're actually perched and holding on to something. So 
there is an element of artistic license added to that. Um, I've got to, you know, um, and I, obviously I've painted it larger than life because when it's reduced down, it will be, the detail will be crisper. So um, for example, these are, here's the, like, this is the draft for the stamps that, that I showed you. So, I mean, it's quite, whoops, put it there. Yeah. It's a lot larger in life but then it shrunk down to the size of the stamp which would be there but it just means that it, it's a lot crisper yeah um, but it also means that i become very fussy about you know even with honeybees you know they've got these these beautiful eyelashes on their eyes they're the only ones with the yeah. um with things so i've actually yeah so i mean it's always a mixture i tend to sorry, show throw more pictures for you i'll put share screen yeah and I see, um, I saw somewhere that you work on uh, vellum. Can you tell me a little bit about that as well as we go along? Yeah, what, what other materials do you use? Is it all well, watercolors here's or? Vellum, oh, oh, hold on, I'll just, just uh, if I was working on vellum, hold on, I'll go back. I won't share this screen then for a moment to stop share. Um, working with, I mean, this is, this is a painting I did recently on vellum. Vellum is just basically calf skin yeah. and it's, produced in the way that, um, you know, the art, when they wrote the Book of Kells the same way. So basically when they've used the animal for the meat, they have this skin, um, you know, they have this skin prepared and they, they strip it and stretch it so that it becomes paper thin. Mm. And it basically means that the paint sits on the surface. It doesn't sink into it. Yeah. And it makes yeah. it a lot more, you get a, almost like a three-dimensional um, look from it. It kind of, it, because it's sitting on the surface, it doesn't sink into it. So you, can you get more detail that way then? Is it on the vellum? Uh, not the vellum that paper? it's more detail. It means, I mean, the good thing about vellum, there's another little piece that mm. I've, I've just basically stuck onto um, a board there. And you get all these beautiful markings. Yeah. Um, what I like about it is that the markings can create a more organic, and rather than having a white, background you get this kind of like feeling of movement and you know you can um there was another painting let's see if i can find it here a painting that i did on vellum if you look at this one here oh wow, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah so um you can see the vellum markings that's the markings of of the cow and um basically it's not people i i very often get you know um vegans coming to me and going oh you know you're you know why are you using vellum and I'm going, but it, it's a byproduct of the meat and dairy industry yeah. all of this skin goes to landfill most of it does it's not turned into leather um goes to landfill so some of the skins are actually kept and prepared you know um for parchment but i i just like painting on it the nice thing about it is that you can move and shift the paint around because it's not sinking into the surface so yes it does give me a bit more leeway um, I, I was talking about, I mean, this is another one where, just zoom in a bit here. So this is like a, a tiny little bee that I was painting. Now, if I was painting a bee, I, I had a, a dead specimen here. And one of the things I learned along the way as I was painting, each painting I learned a little bit more, but when a bee dies, the first thing that disappears, or the first thing that kind of changes are the antennae um, of the bee because all the senses of the bee are, or the most of the senses of the bee are actually in the antennae. Yeah. So um, the bee will, um, it, it uses it for smell, it uses it for, um, uh, it picks up magnetic rays, picks up electric signals from the, from the plant. Um, it uses it for, you know, for looking at things, for, for communication, for direction. Um, there's a lot of things that the, the antennae do. And if you, I watched a lot of videos of bees as well. And if you look at a bee, a bee is a little bit like a dog in that, um, you know, if a dog sees something, you know, its ears will prick forward or a horse will prick its ears forward. When a bee is focused on something, its antennae are pointing straight there. So I'll very often paint a bee. I've got these little, um, I'll just show you here. I've got these little like specimens here. I have a little, little oh, yeah. So what I do is I put them in the fridge. There's a little honeybee there. Um, and you'll notice that the, the wings are okay in that. I can use the wings for flying with that one. But, um, and I think it's missing some legs. But I actually have another example I can show you. Um, oops, squash my bees. Um, I find it 
better to use the, the real B as a subject, but then I will use, let me see. I've got a little honeybee one I can actually show you. Um, where I started painting a honeybee, here we go. So like this one here, here's the specimen where I've actually got the specimen, it's a little black bee here. And I wanted to paint this in a painting and um, it's easy enough for me to actually animate that. Um, first of all, I lift the chin. That one actually had quite a, its chin was up. Very often they die with their heads down. Mm, so they if curl I'm painting, up a little bit. Yeah, they do. So I, I, you have to get the the angle of um, obviously this one. The wings were okay for painting. I didn't have the thing, but the legs have fallen off. But it's easy to make up the legs. They're very once you understand how they move and how they the structure and how they grip onto plants, it's very easy to kind of add the thing. But I would get the body there and then just add. As soon as you add the antennae, it's um, it makes a big big difference. Um, when I was doing the Ompost stamps, this is where I have my Ompost, my, <laughs> I always teach, show this to botanical artists. So on the left, I had to do a first aid cover and I wanted to do the snail shell bee. And the, this one is my draft that I did for Ompost first, which they went, okay. So this little bee, it makes its home, the female, it's a solitary bee. So the female makes it home in snail shells that it finds. And basically, you'll find a suitable snail shell. You go in, it'll lay its egg, it'll gather pollen, make pollen bread, seal the chamber, go off, find more pollen, lay another egg, and it'll continue the process. And then when it's filled the snail shell with all these little um, cavities with individual eggs and pollen bread inside it, it then seals the whole thing with like chewed up grass, which or um, plants which it calls mastic and it kind of camouflages it and seals it. But I did this first one and I was using photographs as a reference and the bee that I took, the photograph that I had, somebody had given me this photograph, it was actually more horizontal and it was on a plant. But I thought, oh, I just turn the bee that way and then sit it on a snail shell. And I suddenly realized that the posture was all wrong and actually with the green bits there, it just looks like it had a bad Chinese. It just <laughs> looks, it looked really depressed and it just, everything about it was wrong. So that's when I started realizing, no, you know, actually it's to do with how they angle. So this is the second one. Uh, what I did was I, I straightened the body so it wasn't hunched over as if it was was throwing yeah. it up. If it was sitting on, on something flat, its body would be straighter, the legs would be, you know, it would be lower and its its legs would be more upright as if it's about to spring off again. And um, the antennae, lift the antennae, lift the head, you know, get a bit more life into the eye. Um, so it's just like noticing little changes, making the mistakes and then realizing how you can adjust your painting to, you know, to bring it to life. How And that taught me that actually it's always better to have a live or a dead specimen there and then to use a lot of artistic license. And I think it's a lot of it, understanding the structure and understanding how they move and watching videos. I mean, I, yeah. I, I went through a stage where I watched so many videos that I, I was dreaming of them in, um, in you know, as I slept, I was seeing bees in my sleep. Yeah, yeah, I suppose there's only so much running around the garden chasing them you can do with it, yeah, you know. Yeah, exactly, it. I mean, I did have a, have a big, I used to go on the bee walks as well and I have yeah. a big net and, and you know, it's really exciting seeing going out with my nieces and nephews or for like, yeah, they yeah. get so excited over it. So, I mean, I have the whole, you know, I've got my bee net and I have my little, I have a brilliant bee app um, for identifying bees and um, kids get so much fun, especially in, yeah. in the time, you know, like racing around with, um, we've even armed them with fishing nets and said, you know, go on, go on, you know, just be careful you don't kill them. So, so uh, yeah, so it's, it's uh, something kind of related to that is like, so the devil's in the detail, as you were saying about, you know, um, yeah. even the likes of like the angle of the antenna and everything. So you've obviously had to pay really, really close attention to how yeah not the bees just looking as still but how they actually work yeah. in nature and why they're postured a certain way so would, exactly so how would you say that that kind of paying such close attention has affected your relationship with nature and, and with insects oh huge amount of appreciation and 
I mean, they're, uh, bees in particular are so, um, they're engineered so incredibly, everything from, you know, the little combs on their legs, mm. you know, their, their tongue. They keep finding all of these, you know, these incredible structures. You know, I, I was reading about the eyelashes on the eyes of the honeybee, you know, and how they're actually spaced so that they are exactly the width of a grain of pollen apart. You know, um, you know, they're trying to work out how they're doing. And there, there's, you I know, didn't I, know I, that. <laughs> no, no. Well, there are people trying to, um, trying to work out why would they have hairy eyeballs? And yeah. I think it was sometimes this came up, but they actually measured a grain of pollen and a grain of, um, and, and the width of a, um, the width of the eyelashes apart. So they would be additional pollen, pollen places to gather pollen. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, if you're a little bee and your existence survives on gathering as much food from thing, I mean, how efficient is that? You know, just, you know, <laughs> stick it to your face. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I've realized is that, that, you know, when I'm working, doing botanical art, I'm very often working with botanists, but entomologists are the most fussy people. So I remember when I was doing the stamps and I had the, the bumblebee and talking to one ex, I mean, he's a lovely, lovely guy. And I, I thought I did well, but he came back and said, um, actually the hairs on the thorax are slightly longer than that. I'm going, who's going, okay. You know, and it's a little <laughs> bit scruffier, you know, their, their thing. But I mean, even, I think even more than that, I, I love the, I made a big mistake actually with, um, which when I was doing the All Ireland Pollinator Plan logo, um, actually, you're a beekeeper. I wonder if you're going to, I'm going to put up that thing again. Are you going to realize the mistake that I made? I, I was- you have to zoom, zoom in for me. I'll I will get, here we go. Okay. What is a big mistake on that? Um, can you make that bigger? Yeah. Well, it's really obvious you can see it there. I can see it. Beekeepers, this is their um, number. I can't see it very, it's, it's very, it's only like a postage stamp size. Oh, really. is it not coming up? No, um, no, no. Oh, how interesting. Hold on, I'll like try to zoom in a little bit. I'll, I'll, I'll try <laughs> sharing it again. Here we go. Let's try that. Does that work? Yes. Um, okay, I apologize for that. Okay, so what is the mistake on that? As a beekeeper, do, do, especially do, do. honeybees, they, honeybee is keepers. Is the pollen on the back leg? The sack? The color of. It's the color of the pollen. Um, more than anything else is the color of yeah. the pollen. You know, I study botanical art. I work with, with botanists. I have all my friends who know so much and I ask them what's wrong with this. And they all, they, none of them really ever made the connection between the color of the pollen. Oh, and the, yeah, sorry, I get you. Well, the only thing is because that's a bumblebee, she might have been collecting pollen from other plants as well. She so. could have been. Yeah, I know. So but I wouldn't say that's a big mistake, really. It's not a big mistake, <laughs> but it was a big aha moment for me when I suddenly realized that If actually, she was feasting on knapweed only, maybe, but like exactly. she could be on other things. I don't even know what color is the knapweed pollen. It's pollen. like a um, a creamy olive color. Yeah. yeah when, I, when I did the stamps, I actually corrected it. So yeah, um, a lot of these what, little pollen charts that we check to see you know what, yes. what the bees are bringing in so well if i that. one of the things i do now is i um i i try to encourage people because what i found is that scientists are kind of grouped you know you have the botanists they don't really mix with entomologists the entomologists don't really mix with you know, um, they might have their own spe specialty, you know, they might be interested in moths, but they wouldn't know anything about, you know, everybody seems divided. And even I was over in um, the Botanic Gardens in Kilmacurra the other week and uh, talking to Seamus O'Brien and he was saying, yeah, we don't really mix with um, BSBI, you know, the Bot Botanical um, Society of Britain and Ireland. You know, there, there's a disconnect and maybe that's what's happening in our world. When you have all these people learning so much about their own little fields, why aren't we coming together? So I very much see the role of the artist as a person who can kind of go between different groups, you know, go between the honey keepers, yeah. honey bee keepers and the botanists and start to try and, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm like a bee at the moment. I'm going between everybody and getting as much information. But I try also um, with the botanical artists to say to them, you know, it's wrong if we are only painting plants, which is what we've, we've been told. I was trained not to include insects because they don't really relate to the plant. And I'm thinking, but actually, 
how can you say that? The whole thing about the plant and the flowers are the flowers are kind of saying to the, the bee, come and get me, you know, here yeah. I am. One doesn't so, exist without the other. You exactly. Know. You know, they have this, this relationship, you know, and so if we're, I, I try now to encourage, because I, I, my point is, is that if we are not including bees in our paintings, are we by default saying we don't care or that they're not important? You know, we should be actually saying, you know, this is, if we're painting a painting of a plant, we should be saying, and this is the, you know, it's like the pimp of the flower, you know, it's facilitating the sex life of the plant. You know, we should yeah. be including that. And then we should be doing things like, um, you know, looking at the color of the pollen. And I'm always telling people to go and look at, at Honey Bee Keeper because you, you have this amazing, um, I'd actually love to paint one one time where, you know, these pollen charts, you know, of all the different colors are absolutely fascinating and really interesting. This is something that as botanical artists, we don't, we aren't really aware about. We're just, we look at the flowers and we look at the leaves and we look at the stem. But, you know, actually a flower is all about, you know, reproduction and having a relationship with nature. Um, I mean, one of the really interesting things that I um, learned about recently was that in, in Israel, they were doing these um, researches on floral surges or nectar surges with flowers. And they discovered they were using, um, I think it was Campanula, you know, this uh, bell shaped flower. Mm -hmm. or not bell shape it's like a cup shaped flower and they had these flowers and they had some of them in jars where they they were isolated they were soundproofed and they had other ones where they allowed a bee to come up and they measured the nectar surge so when these plants heard the vibrations of a bee coming towards them their nectar surged within three minutes to i think like 50 50 percent i probably get that a little bit wrong but their nectar surged significantly on hearing the vibration of the bee and the scientists hypothesized that it's because these flowers were shaped like a like a satellite so yeah. they were picking up these vibrations so this whole idea of and then they had the, the ones like in a in a jar where they couldn't hear the sound no nectar surge they had ones where they um they played the sound but it wasn't a real bee and there was a there was a slightly lower, but there was still was an extra surge. So to say that plants are passive or that there is no relationship ship between plants and bees is completely wrong. You know, we uh, we've learned so much in the last you know year about this pandemic that you know that we're only part of the solution. You know that we're only part of a big nat natural web. You know we should be looking at the relationships between the plants and the insects. We should actually appreciate that, you know, without, without bees, there are not going to be plants. Without plants, there's going to be no food. We are going to die. Like we're not going to survive for very long, you know, and that if we protect bees and if we teach our children to have an appreciation and an awareness for bees, then by default, they're going to respect and appreciate the whole of nature, not just, you know, yeah. the culture flowers that they find in their gardens i fully agree yeah it's actually yeah. since getting into beekeeping that i because i used to you know you'd look at a flower and think oh that's pretty i'll get that and put it in the yeah. garden and it, after then getting into bees just completely changed my relationship with how a garden and it's less about how it looks and it still looks nice like but it, yeah you know, it's, it's more about even just these tiny little flowers that come up and you know yeah if it attracts in an insect or a bird or whatever all the better exactly um, so, and it's watching the joy on your children's faces yeah. when they sit in the garden and they suddenly see bees. Yeah, no, I, I, I look I forward to, to that moment myself. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I know when my daughters were young and they were in school, you know, they would, you, would, they would somebody go, "Oh, it's a bee," and they would all freak out and panic. And and you know, we need to get out of that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. Bees have no interest on atta in attacking us, you know. And stop, if stop calm, focusing on the sting aspect of them because that's yeah. Something last exactly um, exactly so i know like obviously um i'm biased but um one question i wanted to ask you was um do you have a favorite insect or animal even that you like to to draw it doesn't have to be a bee or a particular kind no of bee, i i anything. love i i i do you know something because i've learned so much about bees i i love painting bees and yeah. i very much 
I think in in the whole of our, our history as well, that we've always, humans have had a very close relationship with bees. I mean, I lived in Egypt and they always thought that bees, honeybees were, you know, the tears of Ra, you know, that they were, yeah. they were precious, they were sacred. Um, there's no way that you can start listening and understanding about bees and not feel moved or having empathy for them. Um, I mean, I love all insects. I do love, but I mean, if you said to me today, okay, paint something, I, I probably would paint a bee because I just find them which cute. Bee? Which, or which one bee? would you say is the most um, photogenic? Pentagenic, photogenic? <laughs> uh, oh, there are some, uh, you know what, they're all, I, I, okay, I, I do love honeybees because I think the golden eyelashes just kind of wins it for me. They're, they're cute and they're fluffy and they're expressive. I do love bumblebees. Um, I can't, it's very hard to say, uh, partly because I love when you find a bee and you put a tiny bit of sugar water, you know, a bee that you think is dying and then, and then you can put your finger out and they'll just basically climb onto your hand. You know, it's just, you know, and just seeing them drink water um, is really, you know, you know, and realizing and appreciating that they're thirsty or, um, you know, not, you know, hungry, you know, they're like us, they have feelings, you know, that they're, they're, you know, and when they're protecting their hive, they're being protective, you know, even they'll warn you first, you know, they'll kind of like, you put the hand up, like, back yeah. off, you know, um, but, you know, we're just too aggressive and too, you know, um, wanting, uh, which is the most thing, I don't know, there is a big, I want to I want to paint, I've actually got it on my list to paint, the little wool cutter, um, wool yeah. card bee. That's um, one of my favourites. Yeah, <laughs> I have the, somebody's so having the cutest photograph and I have it all all um, drawn out. But I am, um, I mean, I, I, I love uh, what I, I mean, I like all animals and I like all nature and everything. When I, when I do something, I always start with research and start to build up an empathy and understanding with that creature. I, I mean, the big challenge this year, I've just been given a big project to do on jellyfish. <laughs> so oh, wow. It's gonna oh, be, yeah, yeah I know, be everybody kind of goes, woo, stinging. But, um, you know, so we're trying to um, basically bring jellyfish, it's the same kind of thing um, with, as with the bees, but it's not the um, thing. We're trying to bring jellyfish to people who've never seen jellyfish except dead on a beach yeah. and who are actually terrified about uh, ter terrified of them we're making a stinging garden in bloom and oh, we're wow. also um so there's a whole garden that's going to be, there's going to be an aquarium and then i'm going to be doing artwork with jellyfish but we're basically trying to you know everything has its place in nature you know and people can't see the positive things about jellyfish i mean the easiest sell is to turn around saying do you like sea turtles and they go yes and they go well save the jellyfish because sea turtles live on jellyfish mm -hmm. you know understand that things are connected you know and then even things like you know jellyfish as they move across the ocean they carry little crustaceans so they're kind of like the ubers or the taxis of of the sea world you know the things will hop on their back and and be carried across you know crabs and shells will be carried across for miles or, you know, little schools of fish actually live in the tentacles and they are protected and they're allowed to kind of grow up because they're protected by the jellyfish. I don't think the jellyfish really, really cares about the little fish, but, you know, they do have their importance and yeah. they are quite beautiful. I um, had my first jellyfish experience, like swimming among them this year. Oh, really? During the yeah. summer there. And I actually would be one of those people who's like, oh, jellyfish, scary, yeah. stingy, whatever. And I was swimming uh, in Galway and um, there were loads of them. They, they were just everywhere. And they were really? like, all past my face and everything. <gasps> but I kind of looked around and I figured, right, there's kids out swimming. There's people of all ages out, not a bother on them. Yeah. It, it must be dangerous. And I just asked this woman, um, I said, "Is are, are these okay? And she was like, yeah, yeah, I think so. So yeah just, okay and, and then i actually enjoyed it <laughs> yeah yeah and it's strange so you're gonna put your fingers in and go Ooh, that was amazing yeah yeah um, it was it was and i yeah. appreciate seeing them so close how lovely they really were yeah i know well the other one is i'm i've i'm doing another set of stamps for on post and it's going to be on on um underwater flora and fauna Ooh, and they'll incredible. come out 2023 so i've been researched we haven't decided what the subjects are I, I, I don't decide, the stamp committee decides, but I've got to come up with all these suggestions 
on underwater um, flora and forest. Flora is easy because I probably go with carrageen moss. This yeah. is my, I put forward suggestions and then they decide which ones are suitable for the stamp, which one will work best. Um, but I, I didn't realize we have seahorses in Ireland, two different types of seahorses. Right. Um, and, or, you know, and I love seahorses, but there's other little creatures called nudibranchs, which I love. They're sea slugs. They're only about four or five cents. They are the most beautiful things you've ever seen in your life. Um, we don't, and they're everywhere They're but they, they're nocturnal. So we wouldn't see them, but oh, they're like little, little, they're like little flowers. Yeah. They're like little flowers, um, swimming in the sea. They, they eat jellyfish so they become toxic and they can sting you so they're a cross between they don't look like slugs but they're they are sea slugs but they're just absolutely stunning um so many we know so little about nature so yeah it's, it's what's right on our doorstep as well i know I'd say, like there's a lot of beekeepers actually i'm sure there's many beekeepers who are into art um i know that because in gormanston every year we actually have an art competition oh do you um, yeah yeah so we people putting in their own paintings and, and photos and stuff as well so would you have uh, just to kind of wrap it up would you have any tips for any amateurs who might enjoy drawing or painting bees and how yeah. they might start off well i actually have some videos on youtube just short ones on Great. like just time lapse so you're more than welcome to do that um the other thing well i mean what i was saying to you here is that the most important thing about the bees is actually understanding the structure yeah. and looking at how it looks. So if a bee is actually flying towards towards something, it's better. I mean, I use the, like, you know, here's the, the you know, one of the bees here. Um, I use a dead thing. I use, you know, just like a dressmaker's pin, put it in yeah. the thorax and then I can place it any way I want. The most important thing are the antennae. Make sure the antennae are, are you know, showing, that's where the focus of the bee is. The wings, you don't paint, you don't have to paint every detail on the wings you can actually suggest it as a blur um, the legs make sure that the legs make sense as well so when a bee is flying its legs are sometimes it's reaching out towards the flower sometimes it's bees or its legs are kind of like swinging out behind it um, and the other thing when I if I'm doing a picture of a bee I very often like to focus on the eye I actually have a little video if that's Mm, any yeah. good to you uh, i'll just show it for a few seconds so this is one that i was doing a honeybee one and um i was explained to somebody how i do it so if you look on the right hand side there there uh, are you're the, not sharing oh, there i'm not yeah. sharing it That's oh okay. sugar <laughs> ration, sorry um hold on let's start to get it here hold on i hate this is so annoying okay so i actually have a little video of a honeybee here we go I'll just share that. I'll just share the first minute of it. Yeah. I always focus on the eyes. Can you see that now? Wow, yeah. So I've just pulled up. So this is the honeybee. If you look at the honeybee, you can see how it's picked. It's got the uh, thing. You've got to do those little um, those little eyelashes on it. Yeah. And here's just like a, a quick time lapse of me painting the eye. You can really you can clearly see the compound eye there as well. The exactly um obviously i can't paint the the compound eye if i'm i'm doing something but i i'll very often start with the eye because that's what's going to make people it, it pulls people's attention in you know if you can get the eye actually looking at the person it's it's antenna can be looking at them but if it's caught your eye it makes a more compelling painting um so that's uh, i think like it, it gets a little bit too dark there so as you start with the face the eyes then go on to the the body, um, I and the antennae I add there, and then I and I always always draw it out properly first. There's no point in not drawing. You have to have the drawing right, otherwise mm. the painting will never be right. So I always through because it gets a bit dark here, um, and I just keep adding. People ask me about painting the hairs, like every single hair. It's just tiny brushes and hair by hair by hair. Also watch the direction of the the hair it's a bit like um if you look at a cat's face every single hair has a different different direction um the same with bees you know there are some hairs that are just here under the wing those wing, those hairs will be coming forward you know the hairs are like look where they're going uh, the other mistake people make is the antennae are 
there and I'm kind of doing it, pretending I'm a bee. They're not at the top of the head. They're, you know, mm. they're coming from the front of the the front of the face. There's a long, long face there, and they'll sit there. So uh, um, <laughs> this is where everybody just sits and watches. It's you know, mesmerizing yeah. to look at. <laughs> I know. Well, if you if you go on, I I have. A, a few videos on YouTube. Um, I Your Instagram see... page is great as well. Uh, you have a few of those little videos up there as well, I know. Yeah, yeah. I can edit this one and send it on to you anyway so that you can... Yeah. Um, there's a bit that needs to be brightened in the middle, but um, I think I ran out of patience. Um, and I was just kind of like watching the... You know, just here's the whole thing about painting the, you know, the hairs, every single hair. And then usually their back is a little bit bald. Yeah. So it usually starts with blues and purples because, um, you know, obviously if a bee's been going in and out of flowers, it'll be, um, you know, its back is going to be a little bit um, thinner. But yeah, and then also counting the how many little sections there are to the abdomen um, <laughs> goes on and on. Yeah, it, it, it must be hard to know when to stop. Um, yeah, just when you can't see. I'm fussy, so I keep going on. I keep adding more. Um, but I know just from teaching, the main thing is get the drawing right. Spend your time on the drawing. When the drawing is right, then the paint is going to be right. If the drawing isn't right, there is no way the painting is going to work out. It's going to yeah. look wrong. So it's about um, getting the proportions right and then filling in the colours and the details. Yeah. yeah, make it look believable. And, and you're going to be very familiar with, with the structure and the shape and whether it looks alive, or whether it looks, you know, doesn't look look thing the Hopefully. legs yeah Sorry, go ahead. i was gonna say the legs are probably the things i do last they're probably they're important but people don't really look at the legs as much as they would look at the eyes the antennae the shape of the wings and the, the shape of the body yeah so i'll just stop that one there there if so, uh, still goes ahead again maybe probably this year or next year or whatever um hopefully we'll see some even better quality <laughs> <laughs> paintings yeah no that'd be fascinating i'd love to say share it with me and i'll i'll um is it a competition that's open to anybody or i think i am i'm not sure to be honest i think it's just whoever's there or i i don't know i can't remember that'd yeah, be yeah. fascinating i can always share something you couldn't away. enter you'd 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 win <laughs> would be fair <laughs> they wouldn't like it no no no, no. <laughs> me, somebody asked me like you know but like i have become very critical of people painting be not not because i know for myself what looks wrong and sometimes yeah. you see them you know the um the thing that really annoys me is when people have taken a taxidermy bee you know and they've got this bee kind of like just stuck there with the wings out and you're going but that's a taxidermy bee they never sit there you know with yeah. this, you know um you know and you know if you make a mistake i always say you know just you know added tongue they you know sometimes they fly around with their tongue hanging out because they're that eager to get to the next next plant Bumblebees especially you just see this <laughs> big long tongue coming out yeah, yeah i keep telling kids you know the, the large bumblebees some of them their tongue is two centimeters long unless i can Crazy. imagine if you had a, a tongue that was as long as your body and you were flying around <laughs> no. but, uh, uh. anyway that's brilliant. Well, I think we'll wrap it up with that because yeah, we're kind, no kind of limited for, for time in that. Um, oh, but what I'll do is, um, this, so I'll edit this down to fit into the magazine and then I'll refer people to come and look at the, the video and they'll get the full chat then. Um, no problem. Because there's so many lovely images. <laughs> um, and also then, um, if you could send me in whatever images you'd like printed in the magazine yeah. and I'll get the, the, the editorial team will... Um, We'll yeah, I'll send them ones large ones that I I yeah. have, like larger ones that I have. Yeah, Sorry, as I can jabber on for ages, and I yeah, no, 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 it's wonderful. I, I really, yeah. really enjoyed this. <clears throat> I could talk. I say, I could listen to you all day. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, thank you so much um, for having the chat with me and for showing me all your lovely work or some of You're your lovely welcome. work. Um, I will direct people to your Instagram page and to your website as well oh, you're uh, very where good. they, where Thank they you. can have a um, uh, further look at your, your stuff and your YouTube as well. I'll no, be having a look good. at that myself. Yeah, they're, if they're interested, there's a couple of little videos on YouTube. Um, there's one about painting a bumblebee that they can do. I think it's about two minutes long. I mean, it's yeah. free. It's just, you know, how to paint a bumblebee. And it's, it's on that, you know, um, instructions on how to yeah have to paint it and where to start but hopefully they'll yeah you know what when you paint something you 
begin to understand it yeah. and you begin to look at it. And when you start to understand it, then you start to really appreciate it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, go painting bees. So it's all oh, great. <laughs> right. Well, thank you so much. Ron. You're very really welcome. Appreciate it. And good luck with your baby as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. You're welcome. Okay. All right. Thanks a million. Take care. Bye bye. bye.